All right, welcome to A Girl in Concern. We're going to talk a little bit about a free trade agreement that is uh, reputed to be NAFTA on steroids. It's called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's been in the works for quite some time. Uh, I'm not even going to attempt to, dis to, uh, uh, to define it. I'll let my guests define it. We have David Delk on my right. He's with the Portland Alliance for Democracy. He's got his own program. Uh, populist dialogue that's uh, I think plays on Sundays. Mm -hmm. He'll let us know a little bit more about that in a little while. And then Benjamin G Jarrett's, who is worth the with the Cascade AIDS Project, uh, also the positive force uh, with the Cascade AIDS Project. And the reason he wants to talk about, I'm sure he's a, aware of a lot of other issues with the TPP, but the, the, uh, the, the, far, the issue with pharmaceuticals and access to pharmaceuticals is something you, you don't hear as much about, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, there's some real issues with that. But first, we'll let David talk. If you want to give us a thumbnail sketch of what this TPP is, I know it's, it's the Trans-Pacific means it's all the, uh, the Ring of Fire countries mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah it's it's the uh, Pacific Rim so uh, it's a an agreement which is based on the NAFTA the North America Free Trade Agreement model uh, and has many of the same characteristics of that so if you didn't like uh, the effects of that you're not going to like the effects of this we can guarantee that uh, it is being negotiated in secret has been for four years by the Obama administration and of course when Obama ran uh, for his first term in office uh, part of his platform was that he wanted to renegotiate NAFTA and some mm, of the other I trade agreements so that, that they would yeah. be uh, more compatible with American interests and actually uh, uh, so they wouldn't be quite so corporate uh, focused uh, and of course he's kind of come 360 degrees or 180 degrees, 180, 180 degrees, I guess, yeah. right, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so he's negotiating this new agreement, uh, which will cover 40% of the world's economy uh, with 12, uh, including the United States, 12 nations of the Pacific Rim. So uh, uh, Chile, New Zealand, Australia, I won't get them all, Vietnam, uh, Japan, the United States, of course, uh, Canada, Mexico. Uh, there's some little, little tiny country. I can't remember what the name of that is. Uh, Brain. Br Brunei. Brunei. Yes. Uh, and uh, so I think that's probably close to all of them, but not quite. Uh, Chile. Uh, so, uh, forty percent of the world's economy would be covered with those uh, with this agreement. Uh, he's been negotiating for four years in secret. The only folks that get to see the agreement and to comment and help write it are the 600 corporate lobbyists uh, who are sworn to secrecy, uh, but they do at least get to, to be at the table. Uh, those organizations that you know we represent and you know generally the environmental organizations, the labor organizations, the consumer rights organizations, the folks that are concerned about internet freedom, um, concerned about health care uh, and medicines, we're all excluded from from seeing the uh, the text of the agreement and uh, even our elected representatives who we would expect to be able to to see it uh, especially Ron Wyden who is the head of the Senate Subcommittee on Trade I think that's it uh, for a long time uh, he and uh, his other congressional and senators were forbidden to, from seeing it. And finally, there was enough stink about that that Obama said, okay, here's the deal. If you want to see it, we'll lock you in a little room with the text and you can read to your heart's content. Uh, don't take a camera in. Don't take any paper in. Don't take any pencils in. And most importantly, when you leave the little room, don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, so this agreement, they will cover 40% of the world's uh, economy, biggest free trade agreement that we've ever had is being done in secret. We're not allowed to, to participate at all in it. Well, you know, I can, I can imagine that uh, all the excuses they give for the reason why they have to keep it in secret, but uh, what are some of them? Well, I mean, I'm sure what it really is, but what are some of the yeah. reasons, the half as reasons they give? Well, the former uh, U.S. Trade Representative said quite explicitly, I sure he didn't really mean to be quite this Qu forthcoming honest. <laughs> uh, and honest. <laughs> he said, well, you know, if you folks knew what was in this agreement, there'd be such an uproar, we would never be able to get it passed. 
That sounds like what the uh, person at uh, Monsanto said about uh, about the genetic engineered labeling. Yeah. If, if people know what's, if it's genetically engineered, they won't want it. Yeah. yeah. Well, That's exactly the point. Yeah. <laughs> they were probably talking to each other, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure they were. <laughs> one of the ones that's really involved. Yes. Uh, in this. Right. Yeah. Monsanto is one of the 600 corporate lobbyists. Uh, and I will say, within that group of 600 corporate lobbies, there are a few. Uh, labor organizations and a couple others, but they're you know far far outnumbered by by all the corporate interests. So mm. uh, so um, so that's that's kind of the, the basic uh, the, the you know the basics of, of what's happened up to this point. Uh, uh, luckily for us, uh, at least two of the chapters had been leaked uh, by WikiLeaks. Thank you, WikiLeaks. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have been able to take a look at them and see what's in them, and our worst fears have been confirmed. And so the the uh, the chapter on intellectual property rights was leaked, and very recently, like it just in the last couple of weeks, the environmental uh, chapter was leaked. And so we're we're able to take a look at those and see what's actually in them. Mm -hmm. And and. Uh, 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 my friend Ben here. <laughs> we'll talk about part part of the intellectual property rights uh, chapter and what that does. But um, uh, so you know, one of the one of the primary things, one of the primary concerns that I have about all of these agreements is that they have these investor state protection clauses in them, which allow corporations, if they feel. I should say these multinational corporations. I don't want to lump all corporations in it. I, I don't want to, to. Uh, for instance, the the sign here we had made behind us. The we had that made by a little shop here in Portland. Uh, and they're a corporation, uh, but they don't get to. They don't. They're not at the table either. They're not. But uh, yeah. Yeah. So they're going to be adversely affected by the consequences of this agreement as well. Um, but I lost my train of thought now. Mm. Mm. Um, well, we can move. Well, we'll on. go on. Yeah, we'll go on. It'll come back. back when you're <laughs> right. Not thinking yeah. about it. Yeah. But there was a rally today at noon at the uh, PSU. There was various speakers. Benjamin was one of the speakers. There was a uh, president of the uh, SEIU and uh, Bonnie McKinley from who spoke for uh, towards f climate warming and, and the issue issue was that. And uh, Benjamin spoke, and I think you mentioned that there was like, I think one person said three and one person said five. The chapters that have to do with the trade and everything else of the 25 has to do with other things. And so uh, the issue you want to talk about, is that one of the ones that's part of the trade chapters or is that something that's kind of like even buried deeper than that? Yeah, I think you hit up, uh, upon a uh, very uh, important uh, point with respects to the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, so some would have, I guess, the uh, populace believe that this is a uh, free trade agreement. Um, but uh, I personally believe, and I think anybody who uh, has been able to access quite a bit of uh, information about it likely believes as well, is that it's uh, little more uh, than an attempt um, to instate uh, corporate governance over sovereign uh, um, uh, uh, democracy. Um, and that's literally what's at stake. Uh, and the issue of uh, the chapters of the uh, TPP. So there is 29 chapters in the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, uh, only four of which uh, relate to dealing with uh, traditional trade issues, uh, such as tariffs uh, and quotas. Uh, the other 25 uh, articles uh, cover a whole host of um, various other uh, policy and perhaps the one that's the most egregious that's caused the most pub public uh, uproar uh, understandably so has been the uh, chapter relating to uh, intellectual property uh, provisions and uh, patent laws and that article would have huge far-reaching implications for global health initiatives, access to affordable medications. There's even a portion of the uh, IP chapters uh, that would instate patents on surgical uh, procedures. 
essentially uh, saying that uh, a doctor um, may be restricted from being able to perform a uh, surgery because they'd be in violation of a patent that is instated by the uh, TPP. This Which is totally new. I mean, this, is, this is something where we've never ever patented those kind of procedures. Yeah, right. David makes an, uh, an excellent point on that. Um, I think, uh, uh, I think, and I can only speak for myself, I would like to see my uh, uh, decisions uh, made in uh, partnership with the uh, physician with whom I'm working and not in the hands of uh, 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 a, a profit-motivated uh, uh, system. Um, of particular importance for the access to affordable uh, medications is, uh, as David mentioned, uh, the instating of what's called the investor state privilege. And uh, this agreement, it was in NAFTA uh, before as well. And what it essentially does is it entitles uh, a corporation to be able to have the ability to sue a sovereign government if they feel that that government's policies are impeding upon its profits. We have an example that we can uh, draw from based upon NAFTA and actually this month, uh, uh, January, uh, is the uh, 20th uh, anniversary of what uh, Representative Peter DeFazio, a Democrat uh, representing Oregon in the U.S. House, would call uh, failed U.S. trade policy. And essentially what happened under the investor state privilege with uh, NAFTA, right now the Canadian government is being sued by a pharmaceutical company based in the United States uh, called Eli Lilly. Eli Lilly is suing the uh, Canadians um, for the Canadians' decision to leverage pricing with its medication and offer two medications that Eli Lilly was manufacturing in generic formulation. The patent on those two medications had expired, but due to a process called evergreening, which I'll talk a little bit about that as well, uh, the FDA here in the United States extended out the patent for Eli Lilly for everybody who's dependent upon these medications in the US market. The Canadians decided that they weren't gonna uh, be extending that patent because they wanted to uh, expand uh, the treatment options out to more people in Canada, which leads usually to better health outcomes in the uh, community. Eli Lilly stated that under the terms of NAFTA, which Canada signed on to, um, we're uh, uh, Eli Lilly has uh, essentially said that uh, we're going to take you to an international tribunal and we're going to sue your government for $500 million based upon your policies impeding upon our profit motive. This definitely highlights to me that mm -hmm. uh, while it may sound um, good on a PR campaign that uh, these things are free trade agreements, uh, I don't think a situation like that uh, has uh, much, uh, if anything, to do with uh, typical uh, trade policy. It, it's more policy that's being instituted that places profits um, above all else, regardless of the expenses, and those expenses often come in the form of millions of people's lives being placed in peril, mm -hmm. unable to access medications. And do these courts ever find uh, for the plaintiff, or do they always find for the people they're suing? I know David might know that one. Yeah, I, I, I think the record is about uh, 40, or excuse me, about 60% of the cases are either dismissed on technicalities, uh, like there was one uh, Canadian corporation which was suing uh, the United States and foreign action, I think it was in Mississippi uh, or Alabama, one of them, uh, and then they incorporated in the United States and therefore they weren't a foreign corporation. 
uh, and therefore they couldn't actually pursue the case, so the case was dismissed on on that technicality. Yeah, they were just yeah. like, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. It was. Uh, it was like a forty-five million dollar, you know, suit. Uh, but uh, about sixty percent of the cases are uh, either dismissed that way or are lost by the corporations. Um, I and about four, but but forty percent. Uh, of them are actually won by the by the corporations, and those decisions are really add up to some some big substantial amounts of money. This one that Benjamin was just talking about, they're suing five for five hundred million dollars. Uh, you know, and those uh, those cases it mean that the. Uh, the nations need to expend taxpayer money defending themselves, mm -hmm. uh, and then if they you know, if they lose, well then they have to take pa taxpayer money uh, and reimburse those corporations. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a it's a lose all the way around for the nations. And that's that's with Canada, which can probably afford five hundred million down the road. But there's been some suits I understand against like a South American country having to do with they wanted to stop some mining. And uh, they got sued, and they can't afford these lawsuits. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, th I think the one you're thinking of. There's a number of them, but uh, you may be thinking of the Pacific Rim Mining Company in Canada, which sued uh, El Salvador, and they sued for three hundred million dollars. They, you know. Uh, right about uh, 2008, during the beginning of the Great Recession, uh, the price of gold and precious metals shot up, and so it made mining for gold uh, and silver uh, in areas which hadn't been particular to particularly particularly uh, economical to do. It made it profit. Uh, it made it profitable. So uh, Canadian. Uh, uh, Pacific Rim uh, wanted to and applied to uh, open one of 29 new mines in El Salvador. Uh, gold mining is very destructive to water resources in El Salvador. A um, uh, small country uh, is very water dependent. Uh, so this engendered, because there were 29 such proposals for, for mining, uh, this engendered a lengthy conversation uh, by the population of, of El Salvador, uh, and it was pretty universal. Both of the major political parties said, "No, we don't really want this happening." Uh, even the uh, arch, uh, arch um, cardinal, arch, uh, arch, not cardinal, arch, archbishop, archbishop uh, right, uh, of yeah. in El Salvador opposed it, uh, and uh, so they put some requirements on on mining. Uh, Pacific Rim went through the first set of requirements and then they said, no, we're just going to sue you instead. And so the, the second step would have required them to actually uh, uh, develop an environmental impact statement, which you know is clearly something you would have to do here in the United States, but they didn't want to do that. So they, they filed a claim for uh, $300 million. Uh, and then El Salvador, which is one of the poorest nations in Central mm -hmm. America and South America, uh, now needed to spend their treasury defending themselves against this one claim. And like I said, there were 29 actual mines that were being developed. And so they potentially, uh, assuming that all of them were being developed by foreign uh, corporations, they potentially uh, could have been subjected to you know, $300, uh, $300 million claims by all of those. Um, so anyway, that one is still in the process of being worked out, but El Salvador is having to spend their treasuries defending themselves mm -hmm. and ultimately could lose uh, and uh, either be forced to allow uh, this uh, water destructive process to move forward or uh, and or to pay the $300 million mm -hmm. or, or whatever the settlement uh, eventually is. Uh, but this plays out repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. And another one you'll remember uh, is the uh, Bactel Corporation uh, privatizing the water system in uh, Cochabamba, Bolivia. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was probably, what, 10, 12 yeah, years they ago. Kicked them out. And, and they kicked and, uh, Bactel uh, out, yeah. yes. Uh, Bactel was saying, uh, we own the water that falls from the sky. Not just the water that's in the pipe or in the lake, mm -hmm. but you can't harvest the water that falls from the sky. That belongs to us. At any rate, uh, 
they were kicked out. They sued. Uh, there was so much public pressure, including in the, in the United States against Bachtel, uh, that eventually they settled the case and paid, uh, and Bolivia paid one dollar. Mm. Uh, but that was because of this massive, massive outcry against this mm. clearly unjust situation that they had put themselves sure. into. We could take up this whole hour with just reiterating these instances, and they go on and on forever. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, way back when, about the time of the WTO, uh, Bill Moyer had a, a documentary on what chapters, I think that's chapter 11. Chapter of the, 11 of NAFTA. Of NAFTA and right. if, if mm -hmm. folks out there want to, if, if you can get a hold of that documentary, it might be on YouTube or whatever by now, because he, uh, he really made it clear, and he's, he's really a great documentarian if that's the right word yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and uh, he did a good job bringing that and that up and then and now uh, just you know picture that on steroids is what's going on with this one and I want to get back to Benjamin uh, you you had a lot of different uh, statistics and different things that you were talking about today but you're with the, the uh, Cascade AIDS project and you were talking about a pill that's 60 bucks a day and uh, isn't there some kind of shenanigans going on that's going to make it more difficult for people to receive those? Yeah, I can't so the exact the, the exact. Uh, see, I think I may actually have brought the uh, pill with me. <laughs> I think it's in my deep in my pocket, so I don't know if I can pull it out. Deep pockets. Huh? Oh yes, there <laughs> there it is. Yeah, so obviously I wear my uh, HIV uh, positive status on my uh, chest, as a, as it were. Um, and the uh, medication uh, that I take for treatment of my HIV uh, is this pill um, right, right in my hand. Um, and this pill affords me to be able to uh, work a full-time job uh, to make uh, contributions back to my uh, community. Uh, this single pill uh, costs uh, $60 uh, for each one. Uh, to the tune of $2,000 uh, a month. Um, definitely without access to uh, health insurance, uh, my uh, annual salary would be insufficient to be able to afford uh, that high price. Um, and looking at the global situation relating to HIV AIDS, there's been a lot of progress that's been made particularly over the past 10 years with respects to expanding um, access to medication for individuals living with HIV AIDS so they too uh, can contribute back to their uh, communities. It saved millions upon millions of lives and the only reason there has been that success is because there's been a flow of generic medications to developing countries who just like myself would have no ability to be able to afford a high cost mm. that is completely out of reach from the uh, general population. So, well, most people even in the first world couldn't afford 60 mm -hmm. bucks a day. Yeah, and that's of uh, particular importance for, say, if I were living with uh, HIV in the country of Vietnam or Brunei or M Malaysia. All three of these countries are in uh, the uh, TPP negotiations with the United States. Based upon the intellectual property articles that are in the uh, TPP, essentially millions of lives dependent upon medications for survival are hinging upon what happens with the TPP. What could potentially be the most devastating is the TPP moves forward and these countries are forced under the investor state privilege to pay a certain price that's set by a pharmaceutical company and if that country is unable to pay that price then essentially it doesn't take uh, a mathematician to know what the uh, uh, solution to to that uh, equation is it, it results in in millions of, of people uh, dying uh, needlessly mm -hmm. um, I mentioned I would also talk about uh, this situation relating to evergreening yeah I wanted to get which, back to that as well yeah which is uh, also uh, within the intellectual property uh, portion of the uh, TPP so evergreening is essentially a loophole that pharmaceutical companies will use 
to extend out the life of a patent on a medication. Here in the United States, a typical patent is a 20-year period. Uh, a good example of a medication uh, being used for evergreening was uh, the medication called uh, Cymbalta, a very common medication. You see commercials for that. Yeah, that millions of uh, yeah. people uh, take for treatment of uh, depression um, to the tune of $4 billion in annual sales for the company that manufactures it. Well, Cymbalta's 20-year patent was set to expire last summer in July. And initially when Cymbalta was made, it was for the treatment of adults living with uh, depression. The company that manufactures Cymbalta, of course, knew that the patent was about to expire. So it was very convenient to run a new study and see about Cymbalta's use for adolescent and pediatric patients, many of whom were already actually taking Cymbalta, by the mm -hmm. way, too. Mm -hmm. But based upon what the company presented in terms of data of Cymbalta for use with adolescents and pediatrics, they were able to make the claim with the FDA that the FDA needed to grant an extension to the 20-year patent um, because it now had this new therapeutic application for treatment of adolescents and pediatrics. And they didn't have to change the drug at all then? There was no change to the formulation. Uh, it was, yeah, something as simple as a, a pharmaceutical company mm -hmm. funding a new study, making a slight tweak in language or a slight tweak in packaging and it's enough to instate that evergreening of the patent so the medication never goes to uh, 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 being available in generic formulation. If I'm one of the uh, developing countries that's part of the TPP and I'm immediately overnight thrust under this expectation that uh, I have to abide by evergreening by the investor state privilege, again, I'm looking at making the tough choice on where do I provide medication and inevitably it's pretty safe to assume that uh, I guess the only thing that would be traded with this uh, agreement would be people's lives. Mm -hmm. That just, it just seems to me that, uh, that it's, it's such an obvious undemocratic uh, agreement that it, it just wouldn't be going anywhere. But we know, uh, as you were saying, you know, Peter DeFazio said that, that the NAFTA is a failed is a failed trade agreement, but it's not a failed trade agreement. The people that wanted that trade agreement got richer, mm -hmm. you yeah, know. Yeah. And it's the people like you're talking about that that that, that need certain mm -hmm. drugs, and it's people that want to protect their environment. Uh, people that want to. There was a lot of people there from labor there today too, as mm -hmm. well at that rally. Uh, uh, those are the ones that are affected, not the people on top. We always hear about how the cost of the cost of uh, the wages or whatever and the, and the savings of people who are going down like this and the, but the, the top one percent are making all the money uh, the, the, it's through trade agreements like this is one of the ways this is happening it seems yep. to me anyway uh, yeah and actually it's a, it's a it's a principal way for why you know Americans uh, standard of living has continued to decrease uh, while the standard of living for the top 1% and top half percent uh, worldwide has increased and all the, all the, all the money has flowed uh, upward instead of downward. Uh, you know, it's just like, this is the, this is the, la the funny part of, of uh, folks who complain about uh, policies that favor poor people and the middle class is like, well, this, this is redistributing wealth. Uh, Wealth has been redistributed for a very, very long time, except that it's been distributed from people like us upward. And what we need to do, and partially, uh, principally, uh, because of these trade agreements. And so what we really need to do is be sure that if we're going to have trade agreements like this, uh, that we, in fact, are protected. You know, and the, the kinds of things that uh, Benjamin has just been talking about uh, is a clear transfer of wealth from poor people to the wealthy 1%.
Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, when NAFTA went into effect, uh, they said that we were going to have an increase of jobs in the United States. And of course, as soon as that happened, uh, and went into effect. American manufacturers moved across the border, took the jobs with them. Uh, when China was allowed uh, most favored nation uh, trading status with the United States, those many of those com companies that had gone to Mexico then fled to China because it was so much cheaper, labor was so much cheaper. Uh, now, Vietnam is the cheap uh, labor source. Uh, and so a lot of that uh, manufacturing that has been in China uh, is moving to Vietnam. So we've got this, you know, constantly going down, going down, going down of, of living standards. And it not only affects us, it affects everybody across the globe. Uh, so, uh, so not only did the jobs not materialize, uh, they left the United States. Uh, the jobs that were created in the United States then became service jobs. So, you know, like healthcare workers and uh, restaurant workers and, you know, uh, folks that do service work. And those are much lower paid, much less skilled. Uh, and so there's been this, you know, uh, additional pooling of, of labor, people that don't have jobs. And so wages can never go up in the United States. And of course, you couple that with the attacks on unions uh, in the United States and, and elsewhere, and you have a, a recipe for, um, uh, well, just for lower standard of living for almost everybody except for the 1%. Mm -hmm. I remember when uh, when Jim Hightower was in town during the Bush era, he was talking about how Bush is bragging about all the millions of jobs that he created. And uh, George uh, Hightower says, "Yeah, he knows a waitress that has three of them." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Uh, that, right that's yeah. exactly the kind of economy yeah. it creates. Uh, right. I mean, it shrinks the middle class and uh, expands the, the the poor people. You know, the, the the middle class isn't going isn't expanding into the uh, poor people. They're getting poorer. The middle class is shrinking, and it's all going to the top. And yeah. it's going at a, an accelerating uh, incline, mm -hmm. it seems like to me. Right, yeah. So we need to be sure that if we're going to have trade agreements, um, that it reverses, it reverses all those trends. Uh, and it's designed very specifically to do that. And uh, I, I met personally with Representative Bonamici, and she said that she had personally seen two of the 29 chapters, the chapter on oh the really? environment uh, and the chapter on labor, and she indicated that we did not need to be concerned about that because she was looking out for our interests. Well, I think that the people who need to look out for our interests uh, is us. You know, and we need to see that that text is actually released, so we know, uh, so we know as much as she does. Did yeah, you know, so far, you know, as I said, the two chapters have been released uh, from, you know, WikiLeaks. Uh, from WikiLeaks, and we know that that's not going to move us in the right direction. Mm -hmm. The whole, the whole, both chapters, the complete thing was released. Can can people like just everyday people understand it? Uh, is it well, in uh, such language that. Uh, so, some of it is understandable and some of it's not. Some, some yeah, legalese. Uh, right. mm -hmm. Yeah, right, mm, yeah. I can understand yeah. that. The other thing is, that, you know, we were, I was talking about the secrecy earlier. One of the other, the other parts of the secrecy is that they said uh, that they're not going to release the, uh, the, the uh, working documents until four years after the agreement is signed. Uh, so we won't really know, you know, what countries wanted to do what. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's kind of un unheard of that you don't release the documents. Uh, and uh, based on an analysis of the two chapters that have been released, what we did find was that uh, all of the other trading partners uh, that are uh, subject, that would be subject to this agreement, clustered in the center. So they, uh, you know, had differences but they all clustered here, and the United States was way over here, was totally out of line with the desire of, of the other trading partners. But the United States has so much clout that it can, at least thinks it can, impose those conditions on the other nations. Like it does on Copenhagen and, and uh, with the other country where they meet for global climate change and all that, mm -hmm. they just kind of stop everything dead uh, because yeah. they, they have mm -hmm. all that momentum. 
Mm-hmm. Well, well, so Benjamin, um, we were uh, you were talking about was it up greening or out greening or whatever that that <laughs> term was, and 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 the fact that uh, this one Eli Lilly was able to. Uh, extend a patent because or just by changing the packaging basically of, of what this thing would uh, would do but it seems to me that you also talked today about uh, a company that had a patent that changed something but it didn't really make any really big difference in what it affected but they were able to extend a patent too as well and, it, and is that all part of what TPP is about? Yeah, so uh, that uh, situation with evergreening, um, Evergreening, I I hate to uh, single out uh, Eli Lilly because I think that uh, pretty much across the board everybody is uh, complicit uh, in uh, taking advantage of it um, just to uh, maximize profits uh, as much as one sure. possibly can with expensing uh, lives in the process. Um, I do want to mention, I guess, uh, how slick uh, sometimes things can sound like the notion of a free trade agreement. If you can get something for free, you know, why not take mm-hmm. up the uh, offer? Because it directly relates to what I believe is there uh, is out there in terms of uh, perception about pharmaceutical profits and spurring innovation, research and development uh, for making new, better medications, which further uh, improve people's health. Um, so. The argument could be made that uh, pharmaceutical firms uh, are entitled to maximize profits and also maximize them through evergreening because they need that money for their research and development. The reality is is that 84% of research and development is funded by you and I, the taxpayer, and private uh, foundations. Through universities and such? A lot done at uh, universities, uh, like for example, the amazing work that's happening up at OHSU with respects to uh, HIV and AIDS. The remaining 12% is uh, the portion that uh, is picked up uh, by the pharmaceutical company. I definitely admire uh, the president for having spoken about uh, inequality uh, so extensively in the recent State of the Union. Mm -hmm. I also admire the president for, in 2012, calling on all nations to usher in an AIDS-free generation. At the same time, I'm equally dismayed at how nice that sales pitch can sound on both uh, fronts. Um, In the last uh, State of the Union on Tuesday night, the president uh, pretty much demanded of Congress swift passage of what he refers to as fast-track trade Mm. promotion authority, which he's asking for specifically so he can swiftly sign on the United States to the Trans-Pacific Partnership and go to these other 12 countries and say, the U.S. is on board, it's time for you to get on board too and use all his political leverage Mm -hmm. to get behind that. And that would do it, probably. Mm -hmm. The uh, issue of ushering in an AIDS-free generation and addressing inequality, like uh, uh, David spoke about, Signing on to the uh, TPP through granting a fast track trade promotion authority would do exactly the opposite of the sales pitch that's being put out there. Um, I think, you know. It uh, it was one sentence in the uh, State of the Union, but uh, it was one that I definitely uh, honed uh, honed into, in terms of of me feeling uh, like the speech was fantastic on uh, you know most fronts of addressing some really deep uh, concerns within our country, deep concerns that are also uh, global issues as well. But uh, if you're going to be, I guess using uh, the stump of the State of the Union and then at the same time uh, going into a back room and signing off on an agreement that completely undercuts what what you stumped about, I have my reservations uh, Mm -hmm. about uh, um, uh, uh, trusting the uh, words that are are often said. Mm -hmm. You know that fast track I was going to ask David uh, 
obviously it's 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 to fast track it through but what what exactly does that mean well what it means is that well first just a little bit of history uh you know we've we've had trade agreements for well centuries uh and they have always gone through uh and been approved uh trade agreements typically traditionally have involved tariffs and quotas that's what trade was about was setting what what the what the terms of of products coming in and going out of the, of the nation were uh, free trade agreements do that a little bit but mostly what they do is what we've been talking about here today is that they uh, uh, create a world system of corporate governance and allowing corporations to uh, challenge decisions made by us and and then taking them to these private trade tribunals for adjudication and these trade tribunals are are composed of three judges who are experts in trade and the only thing that they're allowed to consider when they make their decision is the effect on trade. The efficacy of trade. Right, yeah. yeah. So if, if the law was originally uh, passed in order to protect the environment, that doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, if the law was created to ensure that uh, labor unions could organize, that doesn't matter. It's only the question about how does it affect trade. and. Ultimately, that question is, how does it affect a corporation's ability to make a profit? And if it's negative, then the case will be decided in favor of the corporation. And so what you end up with is uh, all levels of government ultimately looking at uh, making decisions in terms of not what is best for their citizens, but is what is what is least likely to get challenged in a trade tribunal. So now to your question, I'm glad on you the gave fast that track. background because that's, uh, yeah. that's important to, it, to it, understand it what fast track can uh, yeah. do. Well, and and the other the other thing about the trade tribunals is that it is uh, very common for the folks that uh, are judges to be judges one day and to be a, a representative of a corporation in a case the next day. Or maybe there's a little longer period of time than, than a day, but yeah. but a weekend, you see, maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But they play both sides mm -hmm. of, of the table. Uh, oh. So uh, the other thing is that uh, one uh, I, in my mind, I, I have a case in California where they outlawed M MTBE, which is a gasoline additive, and a Canadian manufacturer sued the United States government uh, because of that ban on on this uh, gasoline additive. Uh, when that went to the trade tribunal, California was not allowed to be in the room and was not allowed to be representing themselves in that case because the, per the, the government agency or the government level that was being sued was the federal U.S. government, not the state. And so, uh, so the, the actual people that that enact these uh, uh, these regulations or changes in law don't get to sit at the table and don't become part of the process so which is you know, would not happen in any domestic court i mean they would always be at the table mm -hmm. uh, so anyway fast track authority uh is a creation from uh president nixon uh, he never got to use it because he was booted out. <laughs> <laughs> on the fast track. <laughs> on the fast track. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not fast enough in my opinion, yeah, but yeah. Really. <laughs> right, yeah. And, uh, uh, and what it says is that uh, the administration says, okay, we've been negotiating this uh, agreement and we want to present it to Congress uh, at some point and we want to uh, when we do present it to co Congress, well, first of all, we want Congress to say that the president can sign this agreement and effectively make it the law of the land before it goes to Congress. So this is the only time that the president is allowed to sign in anything without Congress's prior approval. Uh, so uh, there's that aspect to it. And then Congress is allowed only 90 days to consider the bill or the agreement. 
and then um, and that split, I think, 60 days for the House to consider it and then 30 days that for the Senate. That means they can talk back and forth Just about Just talking it. about yeah. it, right, yeah. And then when they do consider it, they're limited on the actual debate time. So the discussions is like, you know, we're senators, we get to talk about it between ourselves. The, but on the floor, on the actual debate time, they're limited to 20 hours of debate. So the NAFTA agreement was 2,000 pages long. There was a... Um, a challenge uh, for any representative or, or senator to actually uh, read all of it and I think there's 500 and plus representatives and 100 senators only one of them ever s said they actually read the whole agreement same thing with the Patriot Act as I remember uh, yes right yeah I mean, it's so long and we're quite sure that this TPP agreement will be even longer mm -hmm. um, uh, so uh, so they've got uh, you know this limited amount of time to debate it. They cannot make any amendments to it. No changes are allowed. So they can only vote yes or they can vote no. And uh, they don't actually uh, vote on the agreement itself. What they actually vote on is the implementation of it, which means that the president writes the changes to our law which uh, need to be made in order to implement and and uh, make the agreement effective. Now, just, uh, just as a uh, uh, kind of an aside, one of the things that caused or contributed to our Great Recession was, uh, the, was that Glass-Steagall Act for, that dated back to the, to the Great Depression, which separated investment banking from commercial banking. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, had been um, overturned. Uh, Congress had voted uh, at uh, President Clinton's uh, uh, suggestion to get rid of it. Uh, and he did that because one of the stipulations in NAFTA was that we couldn't have those kind of regulations and those kind of separations. Uh, so, so very far-reaching kind of effects. We don't really think of, of that as, as being a, a trade issue at all. That's a domestic policy. It should mm -hmm. be a domestic policy. Uh, but all of those kind of attacks on, on um, decision making at all levels of government is, uh, is a part of, of these trade agreements. Mm -hmm. so, so in most cases the trade agreement should be separated out into probably you know, 20 or 30 or 50 bills, I don't know how many, to consider all of the various parts, but instead the president is allowed to write the changes, present them to Congress, limit how long the Congress uh, has to consider it, limit how long uh, Congress can debate it, and then they can make no amendments, they vote yes they or no. Yes or no. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't think anybody that's sitting here and anybody that's involved with any of the organizations that are against it are against trade. I mean, trade has been what probably the greatest uh, carrier of civilization and culture you know throughout all all the millennium uh, that's how languages get out and uh, different inventions and and food and and uh, and uh, medicines how all uh, that's how all that works but it's supposed to be uh, at least in this country it's supposed to be for the for the people it's supposed to be a democratic mm -hmm. and what you're talking about is it, very aristocratic it's it, uh, it, it is very aristocratic uh, you know it, we have this perception in our mind, uh, and I think it's a right one, an expectation, I should say, uh, that the government is going to operate in our interests. In the case of free trade agreements, the government is operating in the interests of the corporations, in the interests of the one percent, not in our interests. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, just just the fact that uh, they say it's it's a law that uh, corporations have to keep the. Uh, uh, privileges and, and the, and the uh, monies or whatever for the shareholders and not for the consumers is pretty well mm -hmm. demonstrates that fact right uh, there yeah. to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing I'll comment on is that, you know, this is very related to this whole end of, of corporate personhood within the United States that uh, so the Supreme Court has repeatedly issued decisions which have given our constitutional rights to corporations, essentially saying that corporations are people and therefore should have rights. Uh, one of the rights that they gave them was the Fifth Amendment right about takings, which says that, and I think it's the fifth, I hope it's the fifth, might be the fourth, at any rate, uh, which says that if government is going to take something from you, they have to compensate you for it. And originally that was assumed to be if they took my property, uh, you know, or, or, or 
for preventing me from doing something. They had to pay me for doing that. Uh, that didn't apply to corporations. Uh, but the Supreme Court issued a decision, and I can't remember when, which said that also applies to corporations. And if the, if the government uh, uh, issues a law or a regulation which diminishes the corporation's expectations of future profits, then they need to be compensated for that. And that now is the basis for the investor protection clause that I've been talking about. Mm, makes it, that makes it even worse. It, yes. Uh huh. Yeah. So yeah. It takes that whole whole oh, concept of corporate to person global level. to the global level. <laughs> yeah, right. I see mm -hmm. that. We're down to about eight minutes, so maybe mm -hmm. we can put up a phone number if we can get the phones working. Uh, I'll get back to Benjamin here. I'll probably fire a question at you, but uh, you covered a lot of information today. What, what's something else you may want to let the viewers know about? Well, uh, I thank you for welcoming uh, David and myself uh, to the uh, broadcast this evening, um, and especially the uh, viewers uh, tuned in at home as well, because it comes on a critical day. Um, as you mentioned, today was part of a uh, intercontinental day of action where there was 50 sites throughout uh, North America. Um, thousands of people turned out at rallies um, public events all with one common purpose to resolve and do away with these failed trade policies that we know are failures based upon the outcomes from NAFTA and to revert to a system of instating fair trade policy that spurs innovation that promotes uh, workers uh, being able to build up uh, uh, li um, lives that are empowered uh, that contribute back to their uh, communities. Um, and the situation with fast track of the TPP, which is very apropos uh, uh, referred to as uh, NAFTA on steroids, well, there was a bill on Fast Track which was introduced uh, uh, two months ago in the U.S. Congress. It may have been quite telling that the only uh, Democrat U.S. Senator uh, who co-sponsored the bill uh, didn't have to worry about uh, re-election because he's been appointed to be the ambassador to uh, China. There was no other Democrat co-sponsor uh, to this uh, Fast Track Trade Promotion Authority bill that the President asked for in his State of the Union mm -hmm. speech. And essentially, that's what's hanging in the balance on which direction we're going to go with trade policy. Are we going to put the TPP into effect and all of these terms that we mentioned here tonight uh, go into effect for 40% of the globe, globe's economy for close to a billion people in 12 countries? Or can we collectively take action like the actions that took place today, like the actions that we're doing right now in this broadcast? Mm -hmm. On and a the community level at, mm -hmm. at home and contact our members of Congress and uh, inform them that we don't feel fast tracking this trade agreement is in our best interest and it's certainly not in the best interest of people who may be more impoverished uh, than us here in the United States so it's my hope based upon something that's been heard tonight that could understandably be very uh, distressing, could be a little bit of a uh, downer to mm. hear some of this stuff, that that translates into action because it's not a downer if it translates into something that we can do about it. And on this issue, we the people can affirm democracy uh, versus a complete sellout of our democratic sovereign governments to a system that instates corporatocracy. All right, and as you say, we the people I think we got two phone calls already, mm -hmm. so we only have like four minutes or so. But let's get first caller up and see what they have to say. Welcome Hi, to the program. Hi. Hello. We are, we are so far through the looking glass on this issue. This has been such a fascinating conversation because I think these trade deals are a wonderful way of like taking a microscope to everything that's wrong on the planet. Hey, well put. Uh, <laughs> well that, put. The, that the wealth and the power and the influence and the military might of the American government are used to help increase profits for a handful of people at the expense of the rest of us who are then expected to beggar each other on the street to survive. 
is just an outrage. And I'm I'm in awe that these two gentlemen can sit here and very knowledgeably discuss the subject. <laughs> Clearly they too. know the ins and outs. <laughs> and not be bald from having torn their own hair out. <laughs> and rented their clothing, huh? <laughs> <laughs> A very good program, guys. Keep at All it. Right, thank, I, you. thank you. You know, the focus is so much bigger, but this is such a good issue to get people to, to, to kind of get it. And if it were only for the campesinos driven off their cornfields in Mexico after NAFTA. Yeah, over a million of them. that there's something morally wrong with this from top to bottom, in to out. We wouldn't need the military we have if we weren't protecting our pipelines and our this and our that. We wouldn't have gone to war in Afghanistan and Iraq if they hadn't had the resources that they had. Mm -hmm. This is not an accident. And those of us who are being taken for a ride not only need to get off the bus, we need to start walking the other direction and grab everyone we encounter and <laughs> spin them around and take All them right. with us because this is wrong, wrong, wrong. Thank All you. right, that's some great yeah. comments. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much for calling. And I particularly uh, appreciate that you mentioned the situation in Mexico and forced uh, migration off of indige uh, indigenous lands. My partner happens to be from uh, Mexico and much of his family lives in Veracruz. So a lot of the information uh, that I get about uh, NAFTA is effects down uh, south uh, come particularly from from uh, from my family so I appreciate that I think we had one more call if we can get the next call up we'll give them a minute maybe nope not enough time great 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 discussion all right we only got about a minute for you though what do you have a comment or question well, I guess just a comment uh, I, I recommend a website that's uh, great uh, www alternative trade mandate Dot org. You can uh, read a 20-page summary of what 50 organizations have presented, uh, how, how totally perverse that corporations can sue states, and states cannot sue corporations. Uh, you've, you've highlighted many uh, scandalous mm -hmm. cases. I'd like to just recommend uh, two others. Philip Morris is suing Uruguay and Australia, mm -hmm. and Vattenfall, a Swedish Energy is suing the German government for a billion euros for closing its nuclear plants a little early. Mm -hmm. um, and there's an another incredible case is metal clad in the NAFTA. They, they never operated an incinerator before, and yet they're suing Mexico for maybe $300 million for standing up for their environment. All right, well, I appreciate the uh, addition to the program. We're down to less than a minute here, so thank you very much for your, your comments. And uh, we could probably add a couple hundred more of those, but uh, we just have a little bit left. I want to thank you both for coming in and talking about this. Wish we had another hour. Yeah, I, 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 I would say, one, we would ask people to call their U.S. senators and representatives to say, vote no on fast track, uh, release the text of the, uh, of the agreement, uh, and, uh, and then also, if anybody wants me, and perhaps Benjamin, uh, to be a speaker, uh, please contact uh, Jim uh, or, or myself. I don't know if our email addresses are up or not, mm -hmm. uh, and I'd be happy to do that. AFDPDX.org mm -hmm. for uh, Alliance for Democracy. I want to thank the crew also and the uh, phone calls, and we'll be back next week. Thanks for tuning in.